And I just want to talk for a few moments about a holy God. We worship and serve a holy God. He's worthy this morning to be praised. It says, then Hannah prayed. Aren't you thankful that we can pray? Amen. There's, there's power in prayer. She said, my heart rejoices. Say that with me. My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for, for my enemies. I rejoice. Say, I rejoice. Because you rescued me. No one is holy. Say, holy. Like the Lord. There is none, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Nothing like Him. Amen? He's our God. Last week, we began to look at the plight of Hannah. Hannah was a desperate lady who did not have children. The Bible says that she was barren. And it was commonly thought of then that barrenness was a curse from God. But Hannah was a holy woman. She was a praying woman. She was a believing woman, yet she had not had children. And she had a uh, one who was her rival, the other wife. Last week I had you say, uh-oh, when I said there was another wife. Peninnah could have children, and so she would torment Hannah day after day. She had multiple children, but Hannah had none. But Hannah went to God in prayer. Aren't you thankful for a God who hears our prayer? Amen? Uh, we can rest assured that God hears our prayer, that He is on the throne. We don't hold the timing in our own hands, but He does. So we see that Hannah goes before the Lord, and she's distraught. She's desiring a little one. Uh, we have so many, this church is blessed. We have so many little ones in this uh, church. And, and, and I know what it is now to have a little one who's a grandchild. And we got to go over there the other night. We spent the whole night, and I just hugged up and loved on that baby. I, I'm sorry, Teresa, you didn't get to hold her much. But anyway, I, I got to enjoy that. But here's Hannah, distraught because she doesn't have any little ones. But she prays. And she says, God, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you. And, and we talked about the sacrifice of that, how, uh, you know, that was honorable of Hannah. But she desired a son so much that she was willing to commit him back to the Lord. You see, there's times that it seems in our life that God isn't moving. Am I preaching this morning? That, that it feels like heaven is a brass and our prayers don't really reach to heaven. But, but what we learn from Hannah's story is that we can continue to trust God even when it feels like He's not moving. Even when it seems like and doesn't look like God is moving, I want you to know that God is in control, that He's behind the scenes and He's working in His own path. He's working in His own timing. And so Hannah does have a baby. And she keeps this baby until she weans him. Now, the commentaries aren't specific about how long, but anywhere from two to three years old, she keeps Samuel. And she's loving on that baby. And she's, uh, I believe she's telling him about the Lord and how the Lord answered her prayer. And she's uh, just loving on that baby. And then it comes time to offer him, to bring that baby to the sanctuary, to the temple, and to give him to the Lord. And that's where we meet the text today. She's come. Imagine. I believe she's torn emotionally because she knows that she has to give up her son. But yet the text tells us that she rejoices. You see, she understands. She doesn't rejoice because she has to leave Samuel, but she rejoices because God has changed her circumstance. God has changed her situation. Anybody can testify about how God can change your circumstance and your situation, how he can move in your life and correct things and make things right and, and do what seems impossible. Anybody this morning have a testimony that can say, look what the Lord has done in my life. Look how he's blessed me and how he's saved me and he's filled me with his spirit and he's done all of these unimaginable things look 
what God has done. And she rejoices. It tells us twice that she rejoices. So she is uh, rejoicing before the Lord. And can I tell you that something happens when you begin to rejoice and you begin to worship God. And she understands that uh, there's some revelation. I want you to hear this if you're a note taker. Revelation comes when we worship God. We begin to get a bigger picture of who God is. We begin to notice that he is greater and grander and higher and more powerful than what we had currently imagined. You see, many times I believe that we minimize God, but God is a big God. There is no problem too big for our God. He is a dealer. He is a situation healer. He can touch your bodies. He can make ways where there seems to be no ways. And so as she began to worship God, there's this revelation that he's my rock. He's a strong place where I can put my foot down. I can know where I stand because I stand in God. He's strong. He's a a mighty tower. He's a, a one who rescues me. And so she's rejoicing. I believe that David knew something about rejoicing and God being his rock and his savior for in Psalm 61 David says lead me to the rock that is higher than I for you have been my refuge you've been my strong tower somebody help me preach this morning you have been a strong tower against the foe but then she gets deeper into this revelation of who the Lord is she presses in a little bit deeper and she begins to understand that there's nobody like our God, that he's a holy God. Now, let me tell you that this world uses holy incorrectly. Many times they put an adjective on the end of it and make it vain and make it uh, not about what a, a holy God is really about. Do you know what I'm saying this morning? But I want you to know that we should come before God with reverence to understand that He is the Almighty God and that when we come before Him, we come before Him into, into His presence and even the angels stop. And they surround the throne. And they're just, I just can imagine angel after angel surrounding the throne. And they look at God, and what do they say? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy. And and it just becomes a round and they're saying it and they're singing it. And this morning I believe that we can join them. Would you help me to say holy, holy, holy is the Lord as we look upon his mercy, as we look upon his face, as we look upon the grace that he gives to us. He is a holy God who is worthy to be praised and honored and lifted high because he is a great, big, powerful, awesome, and mighty God. Holy means that he's set apart from his creation. Unique, not like any other. He is far above. He is superior. Psalm 113 verses 4 through 6 says, The Lord is exalted over all the nations. His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? Exodus 15, 11 says, who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. Can I I just tell you that worship will cause you to focus upon the holiness of God. Uh, This morning uh, we we join, the Bible says that if we don't praise the Lord that the rocks will cry out. Well, I'm here to tell the rocks this morning that I come to worship the Lord, that I come to give Him who is holy and worthy the praise that He deserves. Look at your neighbor and say, He's holy. He's a holy God. Worthy this morning. And he's holy. He's the personification of holy. And he calls us to be holy. In Leviticus 19.2, God is giving Israel a command and he says to them, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And many times we, we see that in the Old Testament, that God is requiring holiness from him. 
from us and from everyone that uh, serve him. But I want you to know that it's not just an Old Testament principle, that it is a New Testament principle that God calls us to be holy as well. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Paul says this, Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Now, before you go there, I want you to know that you cannot be holy under your own power. The only way that you can be holy is that you take on the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. That is the only way that you can become holy. Now, you can try and you can live right. I'm not saying out, I'm going out and do everything that you want to do. But what I'm saying is that your righteousness, the Bible describes as filthy rags. But when we come before God and the Holy Spirit has filled our life, we come acceptable before the Lord. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service, the Bible says. We're called to be holy. So look at this. The, the text continues on after Hannah's prayer. Uh, and can I tell you that that prayer goes on for 10 verses. We only looked at the first two. So I encourage you, go read 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2. And it says this, Then Elkanah returned home to Ramah without Samuel. They left the young boy there. Imagine. And it says this, And the boy served. Say the boy served. The boy served the Lord by assisting Eli the priest. The King James says that he ministered to the Lord. Can I stop right here and say that you're never too young to serve the Lord? That God can use young people to serve the Lord. That God used a young shepherd boy who was out in the field and uh, the, the, the prophet and even the, the other sons and his father did not recognize that in that young boy David would be a king who was to come. I want you to know that God can use young people. I want you to know that you're never too young for God to use. And I'm expecting God to raise up some of our young people. Amen? To serve the Lord. To be a, a shining light in, in the darkness for the kingdom of God. Verse 12, now the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord. The King James Version says they did not know the Lord. They did not serve him. They did not worship him. They, not, they acted as if he did not exist. They did not reverence his holiness. We're a Pentecostal church. Can I get an amen? Amen. And it's important that we understand the holiness of God. Now, it's always acceptable to praise God. The Bible says to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It's always acceptable to do that. As long as we understand that we are in the presence of the holy God. And we're to revere God. That's not a word that we hear preached very often or taught about very often. But we are to reverence, to bow, to understand that he is greater than what we could ever be. That he is the creator. That he lives inside of us. And so he is to be revered. Somebody say he's holy. He's a holy God. Worthy to be praised. He, He is... Worthy to be blessed and honored. And we see that Eli's sons did not do so. And in doing that, they broke the first commandment. Which says to have no other gods before me. The pastor doesn't say that they were serving other gods. No, they were serving self. Which can be a god. Self. Uh, Can I tell you that. If all you are about is making more money, if all you are about is getting all the things that you can get, if all you are about is you, 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 then you might be have a God before him called self. We're to serve God and not have any other gods before him. And so we see that Eli's sons were evil, The Bible tells us that they chose 
the choices piece, choice pieces of meat. They were supposed to offer this sacrifice to the Lord first so that God would have his portion first. How many knows that God gets the best and God gets the first? Can I get an amen this morning? You see, they were handling it the wrong way. They went even further. And they were having their way with women who would come to the temple. Even the common people had more moral conscience than Eli's sons who were priests. The Bible emphasizes the contrast between, or Samuel, I should say, and Eli's sons. Verses 18 through 21. But Samuel. Stop right there. There ought to be a difference between you and the world. Uh, you could put your name in there. But Brian. But Ronnie. But Jackie, you see, we ought to be different than anybody else in the world, uh, different from the world because God has called us to be holy. And it's not something that is impossible. It's just something that requires the Holy Spirit active in our life. But Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of a priest. And that linen garment was to set him apart. It was a symbol of holiness and purity of this young man who was serving the Lord. But Samuel, can I tell you that God recognizes when you try to live holy. He recognizes that. Verse 20. Before they returned home, Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, may the Lord give you other children to take the place of this one that she gave to the Lord. Wow. Now, hear this. You and I in the Bible and the New Testament are called priests and kings. And so we have power in our tongue to speak the word of God and to bless people and not curse them. Now, I know that there's some people that you'd like to but you need to bless people. Can I get an amen? Uh, and so we see that uh, here the priest Eli blesses Hannah. She brings her son to the temple to give him to the Lord. And he blesses her. And she ends up having three sons. Yeah, three sons, two daughters. Imagine. She, goes, she weans a child. She comes back to the temple to sacrifice and worship the Lord. Eli blesses her again. She has another child. She comes back. She has that child who's weaned, that new one. And she blesses the Lord and he blesses her. And she has another child. Uh, after a while, I believe I'd stop going to the temple for me personally. Because that's enough children. But anyway, God blessed her. God notices when you try to live right. And can I tell you something else? The principle that I see in here is that you can't outgive God. No matter what you do, you cannot outgive God. She gave the ultimate sacrifice. I mean, we applaud her for what she did. But God has a bigger shovel and his blessings are greater. And he said, you give me one, I'm going to give you five more. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to pour out a blessing upon you. How many are ready to receive the blessing of the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm blessed. She's blessed. You can't outgive God. Look at the difference between these two families. God is pouring out favor upon Elkanah's household. The favor of God upon Hannah. Not that only she would have one child, but that she would have multiple children. Can I tell you that they were not a perfect family, but they were trying to live right. Uh, they had some dysfunction that we talked about last week, but I want you to know that Elkanah, as the father of the house, of the priest of the house, that he was trying to make sure that his family came to the house of the Lord, that they sacrificed, that they served God. Fathers, look at me. You have a responsibility for your household. Make sure they get to the house of God. Make sure they serve the Lord. Make sure that uh, they are sacrificing for the Lord. That's what Elkanah did. 
And God noticed this throughout the theme of these two chapters that we have looked at. It is undoubtable that God is sovereign, that he's in control. He was handling all the events. Sometimes we get in trouble when we try to make it happen. Anybody else out there besides me that try to make it happen? And sometimes we need uh, to just let God have control because God, look at your neighbor and tell him God's in control. Whether it looks like it, whether it seems like it, whether it feels like it, I want you to know that God is in control. And when he's in control and allowed to be, he uses his power to set things right. I would say, Pastor, I need some things made right in my life. His power emphasizes and highlights the holiness of God. But Eli was different. He was supposed to be the high priest of the nation, but he wasn't even the high priest of his house. His sons were running amok, turning their positions into opportunity to steal and to commit sexual immorality. But we see the purity and the service of Samuel in direct contrast. Can I tell you that God will not be mocked? We look at this. Can I, can I tell you that many times we look at people and we know they're not living right and it seems like they still are, everything's going right for them, but God will not be mocked. There comes a day of reckoning. There comes a day when God will make things right because he's a just and sovereign and holy God. Because of Eli and Hophni, the spiritual climate of Israel was going down. A decline in the office of the priesthood. A decline in the spiritual uh, uh, tenacity of God's people. A decline that the Bible says led to the glory of God departing. What a sad state. You see, if we don't recognize... Number one, that God's in control and that he's a holy God. There is the potential that the glory of God could leave our lives and leave this place. But he is holy. And he is worthy to be praised. And he is in control. How many would just lift up holy hands to the Lord? The Bible says lift up holy hands in the sanctuary to to bless his name, to to, to call out his name, who's greater and higher. And we, we sing all about the awesomeness and the power of God and the holiness of God. He's worthy. He has such power, we don't even imagine it. I said earlier that we don't even think about the power of God. Here's a God who started out creation by simply speaking words. Let there be light. And all of the world that we know began to take place. There was suddenly light when darkness had prevailed. The sun and the moon and the stars flung into the universe. And this world began because God simply spoke the words. And we have the opportunity for this powerful, amazing, and holy God to live in our lives. Wow. What a privilege. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, God's in control. And he's a holy God. He's a holy God. When we come to the end of this chapter, there's a highlight on Samuel. He's the hope. Everything seems to be falling apart. But here's Samuel. A person who can make a difference. Can I tell you that we got people all over this place that can be difference makers? Do we recognize that God lives inside of us? That we are different makers? Do we dare to be different? Do we dare to live a holy life before God? And if we will, He'll do things through us that we cannot even imagine.